and welcome to another virtual worship service from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Cleveland. My name is Jess Levy, and I'm a worship associate. Some of us are bringing our best selves to this place, and some of us are bringing our struggling selves. You, with all your hopes and beliefs, your dreams, your stories, your quirks, your insecurities, your beliefs and imperfections, especially your imperfections, are welcome here. No matter who you identify as or with, you are welcome here. Unitarian Universalism affirms and promotes seven principles grounded in humanistic teachings in the world's religions. We draw from scripture, science, nature, philosophy, personal experience, and ancient tradition. We have no shared creed and our beliefs are diverse and inclusive. About today's worship service. Worship remains the core of our time together as a congregation. Through worship, we create connections with others and within. Worship represents our calling to better ourselves and live a life of wisdom and compassion. Our service is usually based on a theme or an idea that is interwoven through music, meditation, wisdom from the global scripture, and reflection. Today, in honor of Father's Day, Community Minister Rev. Rena will share a sermon on the topic of Lessons from Our Fathers. I sincerely hope that you are inspired by today's service. If you are interested in learning more about Unitarian Universalism or becoming a member of our congregation, please check out our website, uucleveland.org, or like us on Facebook. Thank you. We pause this morning from the chaos of the world to reclaim the beauty within these walls that carry us through our week. We lift this community onto our shoulders with pride and grace-filled expectations for our children and our children's children. Good morning and happy Father's Day to all of those in our congregation who have loved and mentored and shared themselves in the lives of others as a beloved elder. Thank you for joining us for worship as we come together virtually, but intentionally this morning. This week, we continue to witness events that encompass the range of human experience, ongoing protests over police brutality and the murder of black and brown lives, continued anxiety over the coronavirus, and the Supreme Court decision holding that the 1964 Civil Rights Act does indeed protect our gay and transgender siblings from workplace discrimination. We have also found comfort in the blue skies of June, and perhaps some of you, like me, have noticed the very first fireflies heralding the advent of summer solstice this weekend. How do we stay present to all of the destruction but the beauty that our world has to offer us? And we come together. We are present to each other. We pause and we hold each other in community. I welcome you to this morning, to this day, to this opportunity to worship together, to learn to be vulnerable, to listen, and simply to be present, to take that much needed pause. Join me and prepare your hearts and minds for worship this morning.
Beloveds, I invite you to join me now in the spirit of what some call prayer and others call mindful meditation. Open your minds, open your hearts, and open your ears to hear these words. Spirit of life and love, we call you by many names and by no name at all. We give thanks this morning for the gift of human relationships. Today we pray for those in our congregation who are feeling alone and disconnected due to physical distancing. May they find connection with us now. We offer gratitude for those offering hope and care on the front line of the infections that are plaguing our nation. The infection of COVID-19, but also the deep sickness of racism. We remember members of our own beloved community who struggle with despair and hopelessness. And we offer love to the parents and children who, for whom Father's Day brings feelings of grief and other complicated emotions. We offer compassion to each other as we navigate our own human frailty and those around us who struggle also to offer the best of themselves to the healing of this world. Amen and blessed be. Please join me for a moment of stillness. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. Lift up your eyes upon the day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. This morning, our Time for All Ages comes to you from many different members of the congregation, from those who are very small to those who may be a bit older and have a little bit more of life's wisdom tucked under their belts. But these are varied responses, some quite candid, to the question, what did your father teach you? Enjoy. Hi, I'm Abby Burkle, and my dad taught me that no matter what, people love me and that I should try to be nice to people, even if they hate me. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. I love you. Hi, my name's Anderson Burkle, and my dad taught me that things can get really hard, but you can still push through them. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. I love you. Happy Father's Day. All right, thank you, Avery. Not know about history, but now I know a lot about history because Daddy taught me about it. He also bought a new game called Mario Odyssey. I used to be really bad at video games, but now I'm really good at video games. Happy Father's Day! Thank you, Daddy. My father taught me how to play baseball. My father taught me how to lose graciously. Um, when we play sorry, when he wins, it gives me a chance to practice losing and not being a sore loser. And also, when he loses, he loses graciously. It doesn't, it doesn't like, and he isn't really mean about it.
Okay, Harrison, what is something that Daddy's taught you? Singing. Do you like to sing? Yeah. What's your favorite song? Uh, leaving on a jet plane. Leaving on a jet plane? Does Daddy sing it well? Yeah. Hi, my name's JC Talbot Shear. I'm 19, and my dad taught me to drive, even though I might drive a little faster than him. He also taught me how to shave. Happy Father's Day. My name's Will Talbot Shear. Um, I'm 21 years old. My father's definitely taught me a bunch of things throughout my life, from shooting a basketball to my math times tables to playing golf. Um, but my earliest memory of him teaching me something, I think I was three or four years old. Uh, the family was living in Princeton, uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And it was early one morning. We just finished a big glass of milk or orange juice or something. And he taught me it was super cool after you take a big drink to say, ah when you're finished and for some reason that's the first memory I have of him teaching me something and I thought it was the coolest thing at the time so happy Father's Day dad we love and appreciate you so much happy Father's Day I was asked to tell you a little bit about what I learned from my dad so I want to tell you there were so many things I learned from my dad of course but I think the thing that might be most useful to talk about today is that you should always be a good neighbor. It doesn't just mean your next door neighbors whose grass you cut when they're sick or whose snow you shovel because they're older than you are. It also means just really being good to people around you. So that is why I have, my dad taught me this too, in my car, always, I have these jumper cables. This allows me to offer help to anyone I might run into in a parking lot or on the side of the road whose battery has died. It allows me to be a good neighbor no matter where I am. And that is one thing I learned from my dad.
If your childhood was anything like mine, then at some point during kindergarten or first grade, you probably overheard a conversation that went like this. Kid 1. My dad's the strongest. He doesn't have to listen to anybody. Kid 2. Yeah, well, my dad is a black belt in jujitsu. Kid 1. My dad knows the police chief. Kid 2. Yeah, well, my dad was in the Marines. On and on it goes. Both kids describing the credentials of their father that makes them a particularly fearsome warrior. At some point, some of the other kids in the schoolyard might get involved and maybe even suggest a fight between fathers, schoolyard style, to determine once and for all whose dad is the strongest. In hindsight, the idea that two responsible fathers would be drawn into a physical fight with each other at the request of their children is absurd. But to us kids, it made a, mattered a great deal. It's as if the child of the victorious father would be immune from taunts from that point forward, presumably because the winner of the battle of fathers would either physically intervene if their own child got picked on or because the other kids would know that the child came from a family of fierce warriors. I, on the other hand, try to avoid these sorts of my dad can beat up your dad verbal spars. My father, who is still alive, is not particularly athletic. He listens a lot, especially to my mother. He did not, and to the best of my knowledge, still does not know a great deal about martial arts. He has never, ever talked about being in a physical fight. In fact, I don't know a single person who is intimidated by my father. He is generally a nice and amicable, open-minded guy. However, to six-year-old Jess, my father's glaring lack of combat skills was a source of embarrassment. Prior to entering grade school, where I learned about all those awesome dads, I had thought of my own dad as invincible. To four-year-old Jess, he, my father knew it all. He was unimaginably perfect in every way. He was funny, he knew what foods I liked, he knew how to fix things around the house, he always picked me up from preschool, and was just as happy to see me as I was to see him. What else was there? Yes, it was only until I got to school and learned about the other kids that I saw my dad's shortcomings. How did he miss the mark so bad? How is it that he never learned how to karate chop another man like my one friend claimed his dad could do? What was wrong with my father that he never desired to learn how to use a deadly weapon? We never own a rifle, and the idea of hunting in my household was just absurd. Side note, it didn't occur to me until way too late that most of those kids exaggerated their father's combat skills, but that's more a statement on my naivete. What I couldn't have possibly realized at the time was that my shock and disappointment in my father not being perfect was perfectly normal. That is to say, realizing my father is a human being, and like every other human being who has ever existed, he has his own preferences, interests, strengths, and limitations. Yes, one of my father's limitations is that he is not a physically intimidating or violent person. Obviously, the real irony here is just how incredibly blessed I am to have a father who is so open-minded and approachable. In fact, as a father myself, I try to model a lot of my parenting skills on his attributes. I sincerely hope that my own children see me just as open-minded and approachable. And yes, even if they are disappointed that I cannot whoop another dad in a schoolyard style fight. It's essential for us to see our parents as human beings. I love my father very much, but I am not my father. How else would I learn to value myself as an individual if I worshipped him as perfect? I would go one step further and say that I do not think it is possible for someone to be a completely effective parent if they are unable to see their own parents as people with flaws. It's not a realistic standard to judge yourself or anyone else as perfect. Hopefully the parents of the younger children out there who are listening will agree that part of being a parent means modeling mature behavior, including accepting ourselves as imperfect beings. In my work, I frequently encounter young people 
who are disappointed in their parents for one reason or another. Yes, to be clear, there are some parents out there who display toxic behaviors which need to be addressed. But most parents out there are just like my father, good, decent people who want the best for their children. In cases where I find a kid disappointed that their father is not perfect or everything they hoped they would be or realizing that mistakes have been made, I try to reassure the kid, and yes, the parent too, that we are all human. The question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? Each week, we come together as a people. Together, we share stories, love, aspiration. We also share our bounty in ways that express our religious UU values. May this important ritual of sharing abundance remind us that making our world better is a task best shared. Today, we're talking about the whole idea of fatherhood. And we've already heard from some of our young people and a couple elders about what we have learned from our fathers. Fathers have taught us how to sing, how to believe in love, how to value emotional strength, not just physical strength, how to be a good neighbor, and how to drive. My own father taught me how to love words, what we now call in my family SAT words, big words. He loved the dictionary and the English language, and he was often found doing a crossword puzzle, the really hard kinds. Even today on Sundays, I look forward to conquering the beehive word puzzle in the Sunday magazine, sometimes trying to get my kids or my husband to assist me in this. I grew up in a predominantly female household 
with just my mom and my older sister. My father was in sales, so he would literally leave at the crack of dawn on Monday morning when we were still in bed, and we wouldn't see him again until Friday night. I've often, as a mother of two boys, I've often been mystified by the differences in my parenting versus my husband's parenting. And I have been told in no uncertain terms by my children, Mom, this is a father-son convo. You don't need to be involved in this. So I watch, and I listen, and I try to learn. When I found out that my first baby was going to be a boy, was a boy, I knew that I had a steep learning curve given my family of origin. And so one of the ways that I try to help my anxiety is by studying up. So I started reading a lot of books about how to parent boys and talking to other moms with boys. I sought to enter the world of boys and men so that I would be a better mom. There are so many things that we can learn when we enter different worlds. I would say that authors like Toni Morrison and James Baldwin have helped me imagine what it might be like to live in a completely different reality. This morning I'm sharing reflections from an author who has greatly changed and enlarged my perspectives on fatherhood, ta Coates. His writing has provided me a glimpse into two worlds that I really don't have easy access into the world of fatherhood of men, and the world of being a black son and a black father in the United States. His memoir, The Beautiful Struggle, shares what he learned from his own father, a Vietnam vet, a community activist, a member of the Black Panthers for a time, a father of six children who commuted over an hour every day from Baltimore to Howard University to make sure that his children would be able to have a free college education at this wonderful historically black college. Coates shares that his father was a very big presence in his life. He was vegan and made, made them eat tofu, and this was in the 80s. He made them continuously read and write book reports on what his father called the knowledge with a capital K, which was his father's large library of African and African history books, literature, black history. Indeed, his father ran a printing press out of his basement to make sure that some of these, um, what were then obscure treaties and texts about African history and black literature were not forgotten. His father taught him how to navigate the streets of West Baltimore in the 80s during the crack ep epidemic. While ta bristled at his father's dominance and his plans for their future, he also begins to slowly understand, as he becomes a father, the lessons that his father taught him about belonging and understanding his heritage and his ancestry. Paul Coates wanted his children to be completely and proudly identified with their blackness, their culture, their history. You may be familiar with some other writings by Ta-Nehisi Coates. He wrote the controversial essay, The Case for Reparations, which was published in The Atlantic a few years ago. He has pivoted to comics, a form of art which enthralled him when he was a child, and which his father would berate him for reading comic books instead of reading black history. He updated and released a Black Panther graphic novel series in 2016. He also wrote a letter to his own son, which was published with the title Between the World and Me. This was in 2015, and Coates did not expect this, this long-form essay to receive the acclaim and the attention that it did. It was a number one New York Times bestseller, was the National Book Award winner in 2015, was named one of the 10 best books of the year. And in fact, after this book was published, and along with the work he did on the case for reparations, 
Coates received a Guggenheim Fellowship Award, the MacArthur Award, what we call the Genius Award. Coates was very surprised that this book, Between the World and Me, got so much attention from white liberals. Julia Davis, a fellow with the Practicing Democracy Project, tells us that Coates has said many times he was puzzled and really, really surprised by the embrace of this book. This letter was not written for white people. So when a person who identifies as white reads this book, we're able to eavesdrop on a very candid and personal conversation, a heartbreaking reflection of a black father to his black son. When I first read Between the World and Me, I was struck by the depth, the rawness, and the tragedy of his message to his son. The book begins with the acquittal of the officer who killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. Coates' son was 14 at the time, and he was shocked and stunned by this acquittal. His response mirrored my own at the acquittal of George Zimmerman after he murdered Trayvon Martin, because I had grown up as a white person with a very different reality. I had grown up with the idea that the legal system and law enforcement were there to protect me and my family. Coates must offer his son the truth about America. And this means telling his son, it's not going to be okay. Throughout the letter, Coates remembers many people in his life who have been victims of violence. The theme of black people not having autonomy over their own body predominates his reflections. The idea that black people can and have been terrorized for 400 years, terrorized by the police, by grocery store clerks, by basically any white person, is laid out clearly for his son. One of the stories in the book that struck a chord with me was the story that Coates tells that when his son was four or five years old, he took him for the first time to a movie theater. They were living in Brooklyn at the time, and they went into Manhattan to see a movie. And after the movie, on the way out, they were taking an escalator down the subway. And his son was four or five. He was slow, dawdling a little bit at the exit. And the white woman behind his son pushed him forward and said, you need to get a move on. And in that moment, Coates went off on the white woman, telling her not to touch his son. This created a ruckus. And he was pretty much surrounded by white people at the bottom of this escalator. And one white man told him not to speak that way. He would have to call the authorities. And Coates realized that he had to protect his son in that moment and back down. But he also realized the fragility with which both he and his son navigated this world still in the 21st century due to their skin color. And so in this letter, Coates explains to his son that ultimately, black people are not capable of stopping racism and white violence. Black people cannot stop the assault, cannot stop the assault on black and brown bodies. White people must stop it themselves. We must stop it. This is what he is compelled to tell his teenage son, who is crying because justice was not done for Michael Brown. White people, if you identify as white, this is our work to take on. Unitarian Universalists often deflect ideas about an afterlife with the belief that in this life right here and now, we can make it either heaven or hell. 
We believe so much in our personal autonomy. But we now must come to the realization that we have been a part of a greater system that has created a hell for many people. And we must take not only black and brown people out of this hell, we must take ourselves too. Last week I was able to attend a virtual conference on mindfulness and compassion. The final session was devoted to talking about the recent murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery. And the panel included Angel Kyoto Williams, a black Zen priestess I greatly admire, her wisdom. She remarked that within the sin of racism, everyone loses their humanity. There is an untenable agreement in racism, and we can feel this disequilibrium in our bodies. And people are saying, I can't live like this anymore. She went on to reflect that this recent quiet pause that we have had in our nation due to the COVID-19 pandemic has provided a much needed space for white people to reflect on their values. And she believes that this space was necessary for the re reaction we are now seeing in response to the murder of George Floyd and so many other black people. Tim Weiss, who many of you might know from other anti-racism work, was also on this panel. And he agreed that the pandemic has played a role in the recent shift in consciousness of white people, particularly since the pandemic has given more white people than brown or black people time off because most of our essential workers are people of color. But he also believes that for the first time, the majority of white people in the United States are now living in fear. They are asking themselves, can I go outside of my home safely? Can I go to the grocery store safely? Can I take the bus or subway safely? Can I send my child to daycare safely? Millions of white people who have never had to worry about daily safety have been forced to face what black and brown people face every day when they step outside of their door. This is how embodied racism makes us all sick. We can see racism as both a spiritual and a physical sickness. But I have a cure for this sickness in my own hands, in my own body, in my own actions, as do most of you who are joining in this, this service. The antidote to this sickness lies in our collective hands and actions. I want you to see that our Unitarian Universalist congregations are poised with the antidote to this sickness. Programs like Beloved Conversations are critical to changing the climate of our community because they require us to process very honestly and intentionally how our white identities have been shaped, how we have accumulated our belief systems, and to ask the question, what stands in the way of me being in right relationship with someone who does not look like me? Our Unitarian Universalist theology can guide us as we struggle to enact what we know we need to do to create a beloved community. This congregation is a place where we can intentionally seek out opportunities to sift through our emotions like grief, confusion, shame, anger, guilt, and paralysis with others whom we feel safe with, that we can trust. In our congregation, we can meet with others who are also willing to be vulnerable 
as we try to this, answer this question about what stands between us and someone who doesn't look like us. We can support each other as we become brave enough to change our behavior, to interrupt racism when we see it, instead of remaining quiet. We no longer need to remain silent in our communities and in our workplaces. We can support each other in the embarrassment of saying the wrong thing because we will say the wrong thing. And we can offer ourselves some grace and those around us grace as we keep trying. We can envision ourselves as white people who are not only vital as allies, but vital in helping other white people become unstuck and to be braver. Earlier this week, I attended the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association Ministry, J Ministry Days Berry Street Lecture. And the Reverend Therese Soto was speaking about the future of our faith in regards to anti-racism efforts. And she reminded us, of course, that as we do this kind of work, we're going to feel lots of uncomfortable emotions. But we can also look at this as the time to allow our legacy to be our absolution. And what she means by this is the work we do right now, that we start doing right now, can be our absolution. And maybe even the absolution for those who have gone before us, who did not necessarily engage in this struggle. In other words, it is never too late to be involved in this movement, in the radical act of reclaiming humanity for all of us. Let us work now so that we can offer this kind of future for us and for our children. May it be so.
Yeah, 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 yeah.